Before we start, let me explain to some who may not understand what turning back the clock means. It is used when a veteran fighter, whom in previous performances look like he is completely out of his prime, and it's downhill from there. To out of nowhere, looking like a five to year younger version of themselves, putting on a show for the fans and doubters to remember. With that being said, let's start the list. Age had caught up to Zab, and in his previous performances, after the brutal loss against Miguel Cotto, he seemed like he was a step behind. The Claudi fight further cemented that. Judo decided to have a fresh start by moving back down to the junior welterweight division, since obviously he is undersized for the weight class, and due to his style, these bigger fighters were starting to take a toll. Judo did have a couple fights after the Claudi loss in 08 and 09, but the real comeback and campaign started in 20. 10. After a brilliant performance against Jose Armando Cruz, Judo was set up to fight undefeated Lucas Matisse in an IBF title eliminator bout. Judo was able to snag the close split decision victory in a lackluster performance with some late round drama. Zab was set in line to fight 26-3 Kaiser Mabuza for the vacant IBF Junior Welterweight title. For this fight, Judo had teamed up with longtime mentor and boxing hall of famer Pernell Whitaker. He came in and uh, pulled that on to Zab Judah. Show me the left hand and pulls and let me see the hook. I'm a scientist and I get my job done. That's beautiful. Now you boxing. It's a beautiful feeling when you can hit a man and he can't hit you back. <laughs> so you know, you know what that means? You gotta have some defense. Despite being dropped in the fourth, Whitaker's influence really shined on Judah. Judah was using his feet a lot more, slipping and dodging shots, and coming back with his own from all different kinds of angles. Judah was definitely looking like the Judah bull. And in the seventh round, Zab lands his signature cross and flattens Mabuza. Mabuza was barely able to get up, and Judah easily finishes him off. Zab was finally back among the world class of the division, and it opened up an opportunity for him to get some big fights made. A really awesome sight here to see at this fight was Mike Tyson, who was in attendance. Mike being good friends with Judah. When Judah laid out Mabuza, you can see Tyson wilding out. Arce, at the age of 31, have had a long, brutal career, though he was going on four-fight winning streak. He jumped up two divisions to fight Wilfredo Vasquez Jr. for his WBO Super Bantamweight title. Arce came into the fight a 6-1 underdog against the 26-year-old. He was also unranked by Ring Magazine. Arce was looking like the Arce of old, and it was a close back and forth action battle. It was becoming an unexpected Mexico versus Puerto Rico classic. It came all the way to the final round. Whoever wanted to fight more will be crowned the winner. Arce came out guns blazing, stopping Vasquez the first minute of the 12th round. After coming up short in the four fight war with rival boxing and Muay Thai legend Virapul Sahaprom, Nishioka looked like his time at the world class was up. He moved up to Super Bantamweight to make one last campaign and retire. He faced quite a bit of success and was able to finally become champion after all those years. Despite becoming WBC champion, Ring Magazine had him unranked, didn't even recognize him as a top 10 fighter in the division. Nishioka flew to Mexico and fought the favorite, number 8 ranked Johnny Gonzalez, turning back the clock and brutally knocking him out to make a statement that he is top 10 worthy. Nishioka will go on to make two more defenses, but at the age of 34, how many times could he turn back the clock? His opponent and in his prime contender, 21-1 Randall Moreau, Nishioka once again turned back the clock and put on a show, round by round, battering Monroe. <laughs> This fight elevated Nishioka to a world-class level that is now being recognized by Western audiences. 
After this performance, Ishioka shot up to number one in the rankings. This would go down as probably one of my favorite Roy Jones Jr. performances, alongside his fight with Anthony Hanshaw. After the fight with Joe Calzaghe, people thought that Roy was completely done. Jeff Lacey was that perfect opponent to prove that Jones was still here and he has just enough stock to campaign for one last title shot. Despite Lacey being the underdog, fans worried if Lacey even resembled the Lacey before the Calzaghe fight, Roy may be in trouble. Due to some drama the night of the fight, there was a delay because of a glove issue. Fueled by anger, Roy throwing with conviction the start of the fight. Though Lacey was landing here and there and grinding away on the ropes, Roy was answering back and his chin was holding up. He had no respect for Lacey's power. Roy was putting on a classic performance, body to the head all day. Roy was able to get the dominant unanimous decision victory. Great effectiveness. I mean, there's, there's absolutely nothing to criticize in Roy Jones' performance at all, and it's been absolutely sensational doing what he needs to do. Boy, this has been a good old-fashioned whooping. I mean, uh... Michael Carbajal was in many physically damaging fights in his career, and as a going away gift of fighting one last time for a title, he was matched against a young Jorge Arce for his WBO light flyweight title. Arce was literally too much for Carbajal early, just way too fast, but there was one thing Arce lacked of, and that was experience. Carbajal was able to capitalize and crack Arce midway through the fight, dropping him in the sixth round, grossly down on the scorecards. Carbajal needed something big since all the judges had it for Arce. Nate Campbell was written off by everyone and their mom that he wasn't going to beat the best fighter at lightweight. Undefeated WBA, IBF, and WBO champion Juan Diaz. Nate was able to weather Diaz's storm and make it close in the first half of the fight to completely take over the fight after Diaz did not know how to handle being cut and swollen in the eye. This gave Campbell energy and he shined in the back half of the fight, edging Diaz in a well-deserved split decision victory. Added note here, my gosh, his ring announcing is just as bad as my narration. Like, dude needs to pick up his game. After showing his age and unable to finish the fight in the championship rounds against Miguel Cotto, though it was entertaining, he still did not look like the Mosley that we were all accustomed to watching against Mayorga. He finished the fight beautifully. This win here, Mosley became Margarito's mandatory opponent. From what I pointed out, and since the hand wrap tampering wasn't discovered till an hour before the fight, Mosley came in as a 4-1 to underdog against Margarito. Based on Mosley's previous performances, and on Margarito's performance against Cotto, the man that Mosley lost to. For this fight, Mosley had gotten a new trainer, Nazim Richardson. In this training camp, Mosley worked on things he had lacked of for the past couple of years, as well as picking up new tactics from the great tactician. Mentally and physically ready, Mosley had completely swamped Margarito. The speed, the stamina, and footwork was all back, and it wasn't like Margarito was a sitting target. He was actually cutting the ring off and throwing a respected volume of shots. But on that day, he was fighting a 1990s Shane Mosley, and a 1990s Shane Mosley was damn near unbeatable. Even if Margarito was not caught with the hand wraps and fought with them, the outcome would have been the same. Mosley was on a whole different level that night, and it completely caught Margarito off guard. Shane Mosley brutally finishes Margarito off in the ninth round. There's another one. There's a big left hook. Why not stop it now? And there's the white towel from the corner. In the first fight, Leon Spinks was a 10 to 1 underdog, and he beats Ali by narrow split decision. Ali, who was advised to retire three years earlier by his doctor after the thrill in Manila, really showed his age that night against Spinks. A big rematch was scheduled, as many thought this would be Ali's last fight, win or lose. 
Over 80 nations paid for broadcasting rights to air. 90 million just in the United States tuned in to watch this fight. Ali, for the last time, turned back the clock. He didn't rely on hanging on the ropes. He danced and completely put on a boxing show in front of a record 63,350, which it took a long time to beat that record. Ali cruised to a historic unanimous decision victory. After Holyfield's loss to James Tony, you could say this was pretty much the end of Evander coming close to winning a heavyweight title. After a good break, Holyfield came back fresh and had some success. Unfortunately, he was thrown in as a replacement to fight Sultan and Bragamov for the title because of his opponent was contracted with hepatitis. My assumption, he didn't have enough time to prepare on such short notice. And here we go with this fight. Evander was given the opportunity to fight 49-1 Nikolai Valuev for his WBA heavyweight title. Holyfield came in as a 10-1 underdog. And these moments here in Holyfield's career, when he is heavenly seen by the boxing public to lose, he always does his best to prove them wrong. The 46-year-old Evander Holyfield did not disappoint. He was looking incredibly sharp, outlining, outshining, and simply giving Valuev a boxing lesson. Valuev was disgustingly given the decision. Holyfield was robbed of making boxing history, and ESPN reporter scored the fight 117-111 for Holyfield. There was so much of a backlash on the decision, the WBA was forced to have the judges study and rewatch the fight in its entirety. Instead of just reviewing one fight, I'm just going to discuss the whole tournament. Donaire and his last fight, prior to joining in the Bantamweight tournament, he looked awful against Carl Frampton. Stiff, slow, and incredibly flat-footed, which that was something that fans were already accustomed to seeing after his move up from Bantamweight. He used his legs far less and loaded up on all his shots. Besides his flash KO power, that was the only thing remotely related to his nickname at that time. When I heard he will be dropping all that weight, and moving from Feather back down to Bantamweight, I was shocked, but I was not going to jump the gun yet. His opponent was the talented Ryan Burnett. My opinion coming into this fight, if Donaire was going to win, it was because of his power. Not many Bantamweights could take a Donaire power shot. At the weigh-in, I was shocked. I haven't seen Donaire in this great of shape in a while. Then I was shocked again. Burnett is not no slow guy. He got some hands and Donair was matching him early. Not only that, Donair didn't come off bloated and stiff. The man was actually fighting on the balls of his feet. He was giving Burnett trouble. Good right hand from Donair, and then another one. Right, Burnett taking punches in the corner, trying to bob and weave, but the knee to Donair finding his range with that vaunted backhand work with a left uppercut, a left hook. Then getting to work again with a left hand. And due to a freak accident, the fight was cut off short, and Donaire won by Burnett corner stoppage. I made a post following after the fight of how impressed I was by Donaire's performance. He had completely reverted to his old self, and I stated if he is able to look like this in his next fight, I could see him going to the finals against the favorite Aoya Inoue. The link to my post will be in the description box. One of the comments on my original post, this guy makes an even bolder statement than mine. Unfortunately, Tete was forced to drop out due to an injury, but once again, I honestly thought that Donaire would also get past Tete. Donaire's last minute replacement, Donaire once again turns back the clock and demolishes Stephon Young with Inoue easily doing his end of the bargain. My prediction comes to life. I made a post following after the finalization of Inoue Donaire and compared it to his fight with Toshiaki Nishioka. Reasons why is both guys were seen out of their primes, both defied the odds, shot themselves back into the world class, and both are in line to fight in a meaningful bout. At that time, in 2011, Nishioka was ranked number one and Donaire was ranked number two. This fight was for the WBC and Ring Magazine title. Whoever won was the best in the division at the moment. Nishioka, a very good champion. I believe that I have to beat him in order for me to be the best. I think he's the best in the division until I fight him. Young and his prime Filipino fighter fighting a veteran champion who's going through a golden age in his career. And now the roles are reversed. And it's crazy enough, it's the same situation. And even crazier, Donaire is the same age for the United 
no-way fight as Nishioka was when they unified against each other. The only thing is, will Donaire do what Nishioka couldn't do? And that was turn back the clock one last time. The only note I made when it came to this fight, if it remotely looks like Inoue's fight against Hirochi Taguchi and he was able to do what Taguchi was able to do, Inoue is in for a tough fight. <laughs> And my gosh, that was a brutal fight. Donaire fought his ass off, was able to hurt Inoue for the first time in his career, and have even more success than what Taguchi did. What made the fight closer was the injury to Inoue's eye. He had fractured his eye socket. It was his first time being cut and I thought that he just wanted to protect it. And the reason I didn't realize is because I can see both of his eyes. If one eye was really covered, then I would realize that there was something wrong. I would press and press and press because I've been there. I know how difficult it is to be in that position and if I had realized then it would have been a different, different, uh, a different tactic. Despite coming off short and losing by a close unanimous decision, he lost the fight but he won the event and the hearts of many for his courageous performance in the tournament as a whole. And for that, thank you Mr. Donaire. This is when boxers turn back the clock. If you want another installation, be sure to like, and if you're new, subscribe. Follow me on Instagram for more video updates, news, boxing politics, memes, and whatever. I'm Alfa Sancho, and I'm out. Happy holidays, everyone.